there's a few reasons to talk about tomato. One is that everybody in Ghana talks about tomato. It's a very political crop. It's frequently in, frequently in the news. And um, it's also a very important crop domestically. So if you look at the numbers, about a third of all um, vegetable consumption expenditure is on tomato. And it's also quite a nice um, story about how agro-processing has gone wrong. And so the question is, can we learn some lessons for this? So what, we, what we're doing is we're looking at agro-processing um, and tomato processing in Ghana, but what we tried to do was a, a diagnostic in a way of the whole tomato sector. So going from production, looking at production systems, looking at marketing systems, looking at processing, looking at institutional arrangements, and then sort of seeing if there's any lessons we could learn, not just for tomato, but for um, agro-processing in, in, in general in Ghana. So what I'll do is I'll give you kind of the mini diagnostic um, behind, behind this case, starting, as I say, with, with, with production. So um, just to get a feel for tomatoes in Ghana, local production is estimated to be around 200,000 tons per year, but no one really knows because there aren't any data collected. Um, if you think of three, three kind of zones in Ghana, northern, central, and southern, um, tomatoes are produced under very different conditions. Irrigated in the dry season in the north, rain-fed in a bimodal system in the center, and rain-fed in a unis unimodal rain system in the south. Um, there's a very little amount of export to the neighboring countries, and there's an increasing amount of imported tomato from Burkina Faso during the dry season, which competes with the production in the north. Uh, I put up to 100,000 tons. A lot of people use that number, but I very much doubt it because we've looked at the actual trade coming through um, from Burkina on the trucks, and I think it's considerably less. And it appears that total production is declining, um, possibly both area planted and yields. And we have to be very careful because there's so little data. Even this graph is a composite of about four different, um, four different um, sets of data collection. But we're relatively confident that production's around 200,000. It looks like it's declining a bit. And there's various causes for that. Continuous cropping, which is a particular problem for tomato. Um, disease, which is an increasing problem in the north. Poor market access, and I'll talk about that a little. And competition from fresh and processed imports. And better alternatives for farmers. Farmers will stop growing tomato if chili peppers and capsicum look like they could be a, a, a better option. You can pretty much switch producing relatively easily. So, um, okay, so that's just a sort of, that's the general production. What about yields? Um, uh, relative to other African countries in the region, the yields are probably comparable. Again, we have very little data to do the comparison on. But overall, they're less than 10 tons per hectare. And if you're looking to compare this with other countries who are tomato producers, such as China, Mexico, Turkey, Brazil, and plenty of other countries, the yields are very low. And um, a lot of the data I'll give you is from a survey we did of about 100 farmers um, in three, three areas in Great Okra, which is in the south, in Brongahafa, which is the central area, and in the Upper East, which is in the northern part of Ghana. And so if you look at the farmers, there's quite a distribution of yields. Um, most have considerably less than 10 tons per hectare. And there's a small proportion who are actually are managing to harvest more than 25 tons per hectare. So some farmers are managing. If we wanted to get a sense of a, a very partial, partial equilibrium estimate, but, a, but at current levels of consumption at current prices, um, if yields could be raised to an average of 15 tons per hectare, which is achievable already by a large proportion of farmers, then the country could actually have domestic production outstripping consumption. Um, in terms of quality, I think this is the last slide on, on production. Um, the quality is very low. And so some of you who know about tomato in other countries, you need to sort of change how you think about tomato um, quality. Here, the quality of fresh tomato is so low that it's not suitable for processing. So what are the reasons people are washing their seeds and reusing? There's a lot of open pollinated varieties, so there's a lot of cross-processing. And there's very little purchase of seeds. So even the purchase of improved seeds, these are seeds that will have come in from other countries that some trials would have been undertaken, often open pollinated, and so um, the quality is quite low. The local, I'm not sure if you can see on the photograph, but the local tomatoes are very creviced, they're spherical, they've got a very low total soluble content, they've got a high water content, they're acidic, they've got a large number of seeds, all of which, um, any one of those is going to make a tomato less suitable for processing, and together they're highly, highly unsuitable. Okay, so that's, that's the very quick look at um, production. Marketing, the marketing system, the marketing system's um, quite typical for a lot of um, fresh, perishable um, vegetables in West Africa. So the marketing tends to be dominated by the itinerant traders, who are variously called market queens. Um, they will typically come to a farmer's, um, come to the farm gate or come to an area where some farmers have gathered together, 
purchase the tomatoes from the farmer and take them to the urban markets. They take them, the transport times is between one day and two days often, especially if you're coming from the north of the country to bring the tomatoes to the market. They have a very strong hold on, on access to urban markets. They literally control how many tomatoes come in each day, that's how many trucks, and who can bring those tomatoes in. So they pretty much are indirectly, but they're determining the prices and the amounts sold in the urban markets. And what this means is that um, farmers have two options. One is a trader comes to their farm, and they have a little influence over that, but not a lot. And if a trader doesn't come to their farm, then they have to look for a market, which means taking their tomatoes to the local market. Um, in general, you need a sizable volume for a market trade for a market queen to come to your farm, else it's not worth her while. And this is a trade dominated by women. And um, or you get together as a group, a sort of informal cooperative or farmers group, if you like, to 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 offer your tomatoes to the traders. Um, we've I've done some modelling with Gilan Galeza from IFPRI, and it looks like um, the market traders get large rents from restricting access to the urban markets in the south and in the middle, in Accra and Kumasi. And it looks like they are sharing some of those rents um, with the farmers they buy from. We've looked at quality, we've looked at um, many different reasons why the prices the farmers get from the traders might be higher. And it looks like there's some kind of Nash bargaining going on there. Um, <coughs> But there's, in general for farmers, um, if you're a farmer who's able to sell to those traders um, in a particular year, you might get higher prices. But in general, there's, in, certainly in the north of the region, there's considerable uncertainty as whether you're going to sell your harvest. Um, I'm going to actually rephrase that sentence because in the, in the center of the country, um, in Brongahafo, farmers find it much easier to sell to the traders. And it seems that in the north of the country, <coughs> the, um, the, the farmers are competing with Burkina Faso that's relatively recently got into tomato production. And the tomato production in Burkina Faso is predominantly to supply the Ghanaian market. And the, the market queens have gone up to Burkina, they like the tomato there, and they encourage production from there. So it makes it much more difficult for the farmers in the, in the northern area of Ghana. Okay, so that's a very, it's, it's, it's very little time. I'm trying to give you a full diagnostic of the sector, but that, that, that's marketing. Um, in terms of processing, which is the focal area, uh, in the 1960s, the government set up as part of the industrialization strategy three state-run processing plants. Um, by the late 80s, they were closed for various variety of reasons. In part, it's structural reforms, but also obsolete machinery where um, spares were not coming in and they weren't updated, and poor marketing. Since then, Trusty Foods um, has opened a, uh, a processing factory, but it basically repackages bulk imports coming in from coming in from outside of Africa, and then it sells on um, the packaged tomato paste. And so um, that's the, the trustee is down in the south by the port in Tema. And then there's two other plants. One has been refurbished um, through, a, through the Ministry of Trade and Industry in conjunction with Trusty Foods. This is Poilugu in the north. And um, at the moment, the idea is it supplies a, an intermediate product or bulk tomato paste that then the theory is goes to trustee in the south where it's packaged into small amounts. So the northern processing plant, it can process tomato, and it's designed to process local tomato that's produced in the region, the, the red area at the top of the graph. But it doesn't have packaging facilities to package into a ready-to-sell product. And then there's another, <coughs> then there's another plant that um, has been involved in a public-private partnership in Wenchi in the West, and I don't want to say much about that because Quabin is going to talk about that later. So he's going to give you a lot of very interesting data about that factory and what he's doing there. Um, but what, what's really happened in processing, um, domestic processing is, has overcapacity and it's intermittent at best, and the government interventions have failed. And so the question is, if we understand production and if we understand marketing systems, can we understand why the processing has failed? Um, just a few, other, a few other pieces of information. Uh, there's, there's certainly in the country, if we look at demand for tomatoes now and tomato paste, there's increasing demand for processed tomato. And we can see that the, the data from the GLSS5, um, which is the most recent data, are not too trustworthy on, on tomato volumes. So I've used, it's relatively old data, but that's really the best we've got at a national level. But it suggests that increasingly people are using tomato paste. Um, and you, these are the numbers that, you know, here it's showing actually approximately 40% of spend on, on uh, um, vegetables by consumers is, is tomato-based. And if, if you've lived in Ghana at all, you know that most, many, many dishes and many days, um, consumption is dominated by a tomato-based soup or sauce of some kind. 
So, so the imported demand for um, processed tomato is quite striking. Uh, one would expect an increased demand for tomato paste <coughs> that comes with urbanization. Uh, also, there's been a reduction in trade barriers due to various um, changes in regime agreements with the EU, WTO. The closure of the domestic processes mean if you're going to demand tomato paste, the only place it can come is from outside. <coughs> and as I say, this, uh, this relatively urban phenomenon of increased demand for tomato paste. So, so we can start thinking now about um, did it make sense for the government to invest in tomato processing when it did and why not? I suppose the first thing is that if you look at tomato in Ghana, it's a, it's a non-traded, fresh tomato is non-traded. And so quite naturally the price is set by domestic supply and demand. Uh, supply t happens to be relatively low, demand relatively high, yields relatively low, costs very high, and the market equilibrates is at a relatively high price for fresh tomato, um, relatively high in absolute terms um, and relative to incomes. If you process that tomato, suddenly you have a highly traded commodity. Um, where prices are determined by international prices and therefore by the most productive countries. And you've got highly productive tomato paste coming in from China, from California and parts of Europe. So what we have is a situation where the government is um, looking to intervene in a sector where you've got an autarkic fresh product and processing, converting it into an internationally traded commodity. And this doesn't seem to be part of their thinking when they went straight for processing. Uh, the economics of processing, um, naturally, but maybe not naturally when the policies are implemented, the price of imported paste is going to limit what processors can pay for the fresh tomato input and to remain competitive. So in a lot of agro-processing, uh, the fresh input is the key input and it takes up the majority of the costs and in tomato it's approximately 61% of your total cost is the fresh tomato. And so if you do the maths, and I have to thank um, Kwabana again <laughs> for, for doing this, um, for knowing, having these numbers. But um, basically the most a processor can pay in um, Ghana to remain competitive is about 150 Ghana CDs per ton of fresh tomato, with a conversion rate of about eight tons to one. And that in part is because these are very watery tomatoes. So for people who know about processing internationally, you'd be looking at about a six to one ratio. But here it's about an eight to one. So the processors can afford to pay 150 um, Ghana CDs per ton to be competitive with the imported tomato paste. Um, so, okay, so what do the costs of production look like in Ghana? We kind of know the yields are low. Um, costs of production tend to be high. This is again just a graph of um, the farmers we surveyed and it's color coded by um, the location of those farmers and we've just sorted them in terms of their costs of production. Um, and most farmers in Ghana have higher costs um, than would be competitive at 150 Ghana CDs per ton. So it suggests that for most farmers you can't have viable competitive processing. Um, but uh, we've looked at all the regions and it does appear, it's not huge data samples, but even if we put the whole data set together, yield increasing technologies in the country are cost reducing. So there is plenty of scope it would seem to, to um, scale up these yield increasing technologies. If we look at the, um, the region where the costs are typically below 150, this is Brongahafo. But there, the tomatoes are particularly low quality, they're rain fed, they're the local varieties. So um, at the moment, the costs are too high, so there's a fundamental problem. What if the costs were brought down? And this, uh, this is an all other things equal argument again. Um, but the fresh market price is significantly higher than um, what the process could afford to pay. And this is, it's hard to see, but this is two years of data and um, tracking the market prices. This is not our track. We've done some market tracking prices by um, uh, Irla and Azam, Azam Kizo, and they tracked market prices for two years. And this is, these, these are not restricted mark, urban markets, so this is not artificially high prices due to the traders restricting the prices. And you can see for most of the year, the prices are well above what processors would pay. So we're not just talking a little bit above what the processors pay, we're talking significantly above. Um, so the one market is in the north and one market is in the west near the Wenchi factory. So, um, so, so the government introduced processes into a system where you've got low productivity, high prices, when really processes are only going to be valid if you've got high productivity, low prices. But it would be a valid question to ask, which is if the government supports the processing and if the government is subsidizing agro-processing for a while, is there a supply response? Because you could imagine um, one might be putting the cart before the horse by bringing processing in, but has that stimulated adoption of technology? Um, and certainly the processors have recognized the need to increase productivity, 
And so options have been to bring your own technology, to bring in seeds and to bring in um, soil testing and more appropriate fertilizers. There's been efforts to experiment with varieties, experiment with technologies. There have been efforts to transfer the technology through contract farming. And the, this is just very typical contract farming that's been tried out in Ghana. Um, farmers are given the seeds of the desirable varieties and other inputs on credit in exchange for outputs at a prefixed price. Um, but, but, but the problem is, um, and it's sort of, it's a no-brainer, but you know, I'll say it anyway. If, if you can't enforce contracts, it's very difficult to enforce um, these kind of contracts in Ghana. Um, you, that you really can't go through the legal process. If you don't have a self-reinforcing contract, um, the temptation is to break the contract as a farmer. If you, if you contract at 150 Ghana CDs per tonne, and you're given the inputs and your productivity goes up, even though it's profitable to sell to the processor, to break, it's much easier just to go and break your contract and sell on the fresh market. And in fact, from the market trader perspective, once you've got the inputs and the better varieties, this is exactly what the consumers demand as well. And so the market traders are even more likely to come and try and buy your tomatoes if you're contracting with a processor. Um, so, so, so processing hasn't worked that way through contract farmers, and processing can't work on the spot market because of the relative prices. Um, it, it, in a way, you know, people sort of ask why was why was processing introduced, and I suppose, I suppose very much you can think of it as a misdiagnosis. Um, like I said, tomato is very political, and so what you have is a situation where every now and then there's a glut of tomatoes, and. Um, there's a glut of tomatoes, and so there's been a great shout for processing capacity. And there's, there was sort of a complete misdiagnosis that, in fact, um, there's, there's a scarcity of tomatoes. And so we're in an equilibrium with high price, low productivity, and how do you get to a low price, high productivity situation? And when you have such large differentials between the market price and the price at which the process can be competitive, it's basically impossible to think that you can have some kind of contract that's going to be enforceable, and there really are no self-enforcing contracts in that situation. Um, if we actually look at the government's involvement in tomato, there's been no state seed, seed strategy. There's been almost no investment in tomato in the last 50, 60 years. There's a lot of seeds that are endemic, and the, the moment there's little, little research and little extension support for farmers. Um, I've talked a little bit about contract farming. Could it be a solution? Um, no, it's not. Uh, in the Upper East, um, farmers have lobbied for cost plus pricing, and uh, again, I was talking to Quabin about the current situation, and they've actually managed to persuade the government-owned factory to pay them on a cost plus basis. And they're now producing tomato paste that's significantly above the cost that is profitable, and there are now large vats, apparently, of processed tomatoes sitting there with, with nowhere to go. Um, and that's, um, and like I say, I don't want to talk about the last point because that's what Quabin is going to talk about. People have talked about, um, you know, having some kind of restrictions of imported paste, temporarily or long term. But of course, there's going to be huge welfare effects for consumers because tomato is such an important part of the diet. Um, and, and this is a story about tomato, and it's a very extreme story, but it really it's, it's a similar story for many other crops, and cassava is one example. And so the sort of question that one can end with, and like I say, this is a diagnostic of the, of the sector. Um, so, you know, it, it then leads to questions, which is, Ghana's land abundant, it's short of labor in rural areas, can it compete with imports that require high la land productivity from the application of technologies? And um, if so, you know, how, how can that be achieved? And can it be achieved with the involvement of, of smallholder farmers? We're going to get two answers in a minute, I think. Thank you.